Um, our, our next speaker um, is uh, Dr. Steve Galletta. Uh, I'm delighted uh, that Dr. Galletta is not only here tonight, but he's at NYU. We were lucky enough to uh, recruit him from the University of Pennsylvania um, uh, as our new chair of neurology. I can tell you that the University of Pennsylvania's loss is NYU and New York City's gain. Um, uh, I've gotten to know Dr. Galletta before he got here, and uh, certainly much more since he's been here. Um, I won't go through his extensive list of accolades, um, which are far too numerous to mention, uh, other than to say that he's a, he's, he's a renowned neurologist, he, he is a researcher, uh, and of his many uh, research interests, uh, sports-related concussions are, are among them. Uh, he's been a, a, he and his uh, new team that he's brought with him, including Dr. Laura Balser, his new uh, vice chair of neurology, have been a great addition to NYU and our concussion center, uh, and he's going to be talking to us on concussive conundrum. I love the title. Uh, so Dr. Galletta, welcome to the podium. I'm going to talk about con concussive conundrum and what it's all about, and really is a dilemma because we value sport so much in our society, and it teaches us so much about teamwork and overcoming adversity. But as you know, concussion in sport has received national media attention. Why? Why now? because we've learned an enormous amount over the past decade. And there's been a doubling of the concussion rate, maybe related to the size and the speed of players, but as Adam Gray suggested, probably due to increased recognition. And we've also become aware of potential long-term side effects in some athletes. I put this slide up to show what it was like back in the day. When I was playing football, they would say, oh, you got your bell rung, go see Bernie the trainer. And you'd go over there, and he'd give you smelling salts, and you'd get back in the game. And, and the point is that getting your bell rung is equivalent to a concussion, which is equivalent to mild traumatic brain injury. And in the first day of medical school, they told us that what you learn in medical school, 50% of it will be wrong. The problem is, you don't know which 50% it's going to be. <laughs> and, and that's the important thing about medicine, is that you should always be willing to change your mind as scientific inquiry and research disprove what you've believed in your heart. And I think we're at the beginning stages in this regard when we talk about concussion. We've heard the definitions of concussion. We've heard about it being an impulsive blow to the body or head. It does not have to result from direct contact. And it is a new neurologic symptom that appears, whether it be headache or dizziness or double vision. And as Steve has emphasized, loss of consciousness occurs in less than 10% of athletes who have it. And despite the high numbers of patients that have concussion, only 15% or less ever see a medical doctor. There are many ways of uh, causing brain injury. It doesn't necessarily have to be that you're unlucky in sport down here, but you could be trying to impress some people and go bad, a bad wheelie. <laughs> or you could try something really creative, like running your bike over a huge mountain and then become disengaged. I want to show you a video that will emphasize why no equipment, no helmet, will significantly reduce concussions. In fact, we all have a great helmet, our skull. And what people fail to recognize is that the brain moves inside the skull when it's whipped. And with a boxing blow to the side, you see this rotation that occurs with, with a concussion. So helmets will only make a tiny incremental difference in terms of concussion risk and rate. And so what do we believe happens during concussion is that that force, that push of the brain, that movement of the brain stretches the cables in the brain that we call axons, 
and like telephone wires that connect one part of the brain to another, they're interrupted by the stretch that occurs with moving the brain. It is like an earthquake has occurred in the brain and there is a disruption of talk to other parts of the brain. You see it stops there. And if the stretch is severe enough, some of the cables will be injured and will result in, as we see in the top picture, from a brain, this brown stuff is equivalent to this, a accumulation of proteins here that reflect the severe and permanent injury to the brain. So we've learned a lot about all this over the last decade. But the problem right now is no one knows when it's enough for any given individual. It may be a single concussion for some, and for others, they may have 20 and do incredibly well. And that's what we need with research. We need better biomarkers, better imaging predictors of who's at greatest risk here. And we have learned from professional cohorts of athletes that the number of concussions may be important. In this study of NFL football players, a large study, we see that those patients who have had one to two concussions have memory problems about 8.8% of the time. Those with three or more go up to 17%. And so concussions themselves are probably important in the risk for a memory impairment, but not everyone, not everyone. We've also now in the last year, and the references are down at the bottom here, have noted that high school and collegiate athletes are also vulnerable. In one study, high school athletes who had two or more concussions had lower GPAs and more symptoms than those without them. In a collegiate cohort just published in the prestigious journal of neurology, Looking with helmet telemetry where they could see the blows at Brown, Dartmouth, and Virginia Tech, they found, excluding those with concussion, that those athletes that had the most subconcussive blows, blows that didn't result in concussion, that 22% of them had impaired new learning versus a control population, like track athletes. And a similar finding was also noted in a high school cohort. So concussion, in my opinion, once an athlete's old enough to understand it, clearly youth athletes, a lot of the burden falls on the parent. It is largely up to the athlete, at least at the collegiate level and beyond, not to hide concussions. We recently did a survey, an anonymous survey, at the University of Pennsylvania, 266 athletes anonymously surveyed told us that they hit a concussion in the past, and up to 25% of them said they would hide it in the future. Why? Because they thought it wasn't serious enough, they didn't know it was a concussion, or they didn't want to leave the game and disappoint their teammates. We need a lot of educational effort in this regard. So what can one do? One can clearly, as Adam Graves has emphasized, use proper technique. Don't lead with your head. Know the symptoms of concussion. And when in doubt, sit it out. It is dangerous to receive a second concussion while you're having symptoms because the brain is at a high metabolic state. And in that vulnerable state, that low energy state, the brain is vulnerable to a second injury and may be um, coincident with persistent symptoms. So we would advise getting baseline testing, cognitive balance, and vision testing. Thank you very much.